Hey there, my name is Jamie and I'm a digital artist, and today I'm basically going to show my process for how I create splash arts in the style of Rui Komatsuzaki, who was the lead artist for Danganronpa. So hopefully this can help you if you're thinking about making art in that style. Quick warning, I will be spoiling a major plot point for Dangan Rebirth Voices, not that it really matters because the series got cancelled, but just thought I'd say that before I jump in. Another warning, so I'll be going through some of the more technical and anatomical side of drawing in this style. I'll be talking about some of the details and thought processes that I go through when I'm drawing, but some of the phrases that I use might be kind of hard to explain for me, because I'm not really the best explainer. Um, I think in order to get a fuller understanding, you probably need to know some basic digital painting and digital art terminology. So like knowing how layers and masks and, and airbrushes and opacity and all that kind of stuff works. Uh, how that works would really help. Um, if you aren't really that familiar with that kind of stuff, I would recommend you watch a different video to kind of familiarize yourself with that kind of vocab instead of watching this one. And there's a bunch of them online, so I don't think it should be that hard to find it. Um, but this, this video really shouldn't be your first tutorial for drawing because I'm not that great at explaining things, so sorry about that. So first of all, I'll address why I'm a credible source, so to speak. Uh, I was a fangan artist for a little over a year. Uh, basically, a fangan is a fan-made Danganronpa spin-off. I drew for a project titled Danganronpa Rebirth Voices, also known as Dangan Rebirth Voices, and we had a few videos and then the series got cancelled, but, you know, whatever. I continued drawing fan art of the series to get some kind of emotional closure, and in that time I think I improved my style quite a bit. So basically by now I think I've gotten a good grasp on how to approach this kind of style. In this video, I'll be making an alternate splash art for Mikoto Itsuki, a character from Dangan Rebirth Voices. Her hidden talent is the ultimate bodyguard, and I'll be drawing her pose that is depicted in her splash art. The drawing program that I'm using is Autodesk Sketchbook, which is an app for the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil. Uh, here are my primary brush settings. This is the brush I use for almost everything. I use it to paint, erase, blend. For erasing, there's a little quick menu that you can use to toggle into a transparent color, so that's how I usually erase. I still use an eraser tool, I have a hard brush or a hard eraser that I use for cleaning up edges, and I have a softer eraser that I use for feathering, but I feel like it's hard to control for details, and the brush is easier to use anyway. And another thing is, on my brush settings, I don't use size tapering, and the reason I don't use that is because I find it a lot more precise if I'm able to erase the ends of strokes, basically a manual taper to get that kind of effect, rather than relying on the sort of RNG pressure levels of the tapering to get that effect. I don't know if that's faithful to Komatsuzaki's art style, but it's a more personal choice for me. Some people have asked me why I don't use Procreate and why I use Autodesk Sketchbook, and the main reason is that I haven't found out how to recreate this exact brush in Procreate. But I do use Procreate and Photoshop to create a texture overlay. I won't be showing that here, but basically if you import a texture to a new layer uh, over the entire piece and set it to an overlay blend mode and turn on clipping mask, that would give you a texture for your entire artwork. Uh, Komatsuzaki tends to use a texture on his sprite work as well as his artwork, but he sometimes doesn't texture the face. So for a completely faithful style, erase the part of the texture that covers the face. So like most artists, I start out with a basic gesture drawing, which I didn't record unfortunately, so I just have this still image here. I generally like to sketch in blue or red, so I have them as part of my swatches, and this basically helps me differentiate when I draw line art over the sketch. So the point of a gesture drawing is to capture the dynamicness of a pose, and for this one, I wanted the pose to be really dynamic, like she's in action, or in the middle of a gunfight. So after that, I redid the sketch and added some more details, and here you can see kind of the beginnings of a face, gloves, she has a bag on her left thigh, so that's what I do with the second sketch, just add more details and fix some things. And then for this one, I chose to do a third sketch. Usually I only stick with two. I start with the gesture, and then I go into more of a kind of detailed sketch, and then that's when I'll start the line work. But for this piece in particular, because my second sketch wasn't that detailed, I chose to make a third one to make some changes, especially for the breast area because I find drawing breasts kind of difficult, even when they're clothed, and especially in this kind of weird perspective. So I try to get that form right in my last sketch. So at this point, I want to mention that I use a lot of references for my work, especially with this piece, and I really want to recommend an app called Viziref. 
VizRef is relatively new, and it's basically an iOS-specific app, much like Procreate, that lets you view your references side-by-side -side with your actual drawing in a sort of idea board format. It was designed to work with Procreate, but it works well with Autodesk Sketchbook and many of the major digital art apps on iPad as well. To my knowledge, it doesn't work well with Adobe Fresco, but I'm not entirely sure because I don't use that app, so. Okay, so now I'm starting to line. As you can see, it's pretty loose, pretty sketchy, and that's because I eventually will paint over the lines. Uh, so usually I have my head and body layers separate, not only for the line work, but also for the colors, and sometimes I put specific parts on their own layer and merge them later as well. Um, but for this one, I chose to do all the the entire body on the same layer uh, for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why, if I'm honest, but as you can see, it does make it easier to erase and clean up the lines. I'm starting to use VizRef on the side now. Here you can see that the gun is pretty difficult to get all the details right, so I'm relying on a reference that I found with different perspectives to try to get that angle right. And I will go back and correct that later, so no worries about any mistakes right now. So now I'm starting to lay in the flat colors after the line art is done. I first put a layer underneath the lines so I can go in with a big opaque brush just to block in colors. And I changed the background to gray so I can clearly see the skin color uh, because it's rather light on the white background. A lot of people choose to use fill or paint bucket tool to block in colors, but I don't really think that's as reliable as going in with a paintbrush by yourself. Uh, I do use the paint bucket sparingly, but not for that many things. I'll talk really quickly about how I think colors are chosen for Danganronpa characters, uh, specifically for the clothes. I haven't been able to find a pattern in characters' hair colors, but something I noticed is that most of the character designs have one or two base colors where shades of it are used throughout the design, and then there's one bold striking color that is featured on only one or two clothing parts. So for example, Mikan's base color is a light pink slash white, and then the one bold color is red. And I think the colors are chosen to reflect the kind of personality that the character has. So like with Mikan, she seems really pure and girly, hence the pink and white. But the pink is on the cooler shade rather than the warmer shade to kind of show she's uh, more of an outcast, kind of cold. Uh, and then she has a darker and sexier side to her that's usually hidden, so that's why the red is used sparingly. Uh, but this is just something you might want to think about when designing your own characters. It doesn't really have anything to do with the drawing process. I don't even know if this is how they actually choose colors. This is just kind of my theory. Anyways, now I'm at the stage where I'm redrawing the eyes. And I think the lines that I'm doing right now are actually going to be used in the final. Um, but it's really important to get the eyes right, because they're one of the defining features for Kamatsuzaki's art style. Basically with the eyes, the eyes are usually pretty big, uh, but they're more wide than they are tall. Um, the way I tried to learn, try being the keyword here, how to draw faces in his style is just by looking at a ton of his actual work. So in a bunch of his splash artwork for a lot of the Danganronpa characters, he does a lot of like 3 fourths angles, and sometimes he does some like wacky and dynamic perspectives, but looking at how the faces are positioned in his artwork is a really useful tool for making sure you get the eyes and the face to look right. Um, even now, like as I'm looking back at this footage, uh, the face doesn't look entirely right, but I think I fix it later, so it's fine. So now it's time for the hair. You can see I kind of started the hair already. Um, anyway, so for the hair, basically what I like to think about in terms of shading is that the hair behaves like clumps rather than individual strands. So like Mikoto has a bang on her left, and I chose to emphasize that there's a clump there. And then she has the rest of her hair that kind of sweeps over her right eye, and she has a longer side bang over that. So looking at how her hair is in this situation, I basically chose to emphasize a few parts. And also with Mikoto specifically, because this character looks a lot like Kaede from the original series, I'm going for a hairstyle that is similar to the one Kaede actually had in her official artwork. The hairstyles aren't exactly the same, and their poses are super different, but the hair I think is quite similar. Uh, one thing I do want to mention with the hairstyles in Danganronpa, specifically with the females, is that there is a sort of pattern to their hairstyles. Um, it seems to be that there's usually a parting in the middle that is emphasized, and then there are usually bangs covering the forehead, and there are some exceptions to that, but um, usually there's bangs, and then there's side bangs that are right in front of the ears, and sort of covering the ears. Uh, one thing that was introduced in V3 is that characters with side bangs would sometimes have one longer than the other, and besides that though, uh, the hair designs seem pretty consistent. 
The males, on the other hand, have crazy and hard to characterize hairstyles, so I won't really touch on that. So one thing that I did change about the Komatsuzaki style is that I made the irises circular rather than ovalish. And that's kind of a stylistic choice that I personally chose. It's not necessarily faithful to his original design, uh, but I just wanted to call that to attention because if you do want to draw something that's close to his style, many of the cute or normal looking characters have uh, those ovalish irises and that will help your art look similar to his. So next for the highlight of the hair, I'm using a hard brush to make a kind of curve in the middle of the hair and I'm using a soft eraser to do a feathering effect on the sides. I'm not entirely sure what color to use for the highlights, sometimes I use a light orange on a normal layer, sometimes I use white on an overlay layer, and then sometimes it's a color dodge layer and the color is based on the original hair color. Uh, basically it's just a trial and error kind of deal, at least for me. Uh, and now I'm making a multiply layer, so I, I dropped the original hair color and colored in the whole hair shape on a new layer. And then I used a soft eraser on a bigger size to erase the top part. So basically what this does is it adds a really nice shading gradient to the bottom of the hair. I don't know if this is a practice I picked up actually from looking at Kamatsuzaki's art or a personal stylistic choice, but I think it does help the hair look more cohesive. Now moving on to the clothes. I use a ton of references for this stage, especially because Mikoto is wearing an outfit completely different from her sprite art. When I get to shading, I start following closely to Kamatsuzaki's style, but because Mikoto is wearing a different style of clothing, I actually deviate a lot from his style. So with Kamatsuzaki's style, a lot of the characters wear cotton or maybe silk or maybe synthetic, but for this outfit, it's almost completely latex. So latex has a completely different kind of texture and lighting and shine than the other materials, and that's just because the material that most school uniforms has is cotton and not latex. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that till later. Right now, I am using the same shading strokes that Kamatsuzaki generally uses in his art style. Anyway, so I'm going to go into how I shade before I go into the highlights. So I shade on the same layer as the flat colors rather than using a multiply or screen layer, which is for highlights. And this is because I think that shading on the same layer is more reliable because sometimes when you merge multiply or screen layers, the shading is inconsistent in certain areas and it looks weird. And anyways, it's better to have less layers so it's more manageable um, than having more and having like 600 of them. The strokes I'm making right now seem kind of random, but basically what I'm thinking about is which parts of her clothes face the light, which parts are hidden, and which parts of the clothing will the folds bunch up. So I start with the question, where's my light source in relation to Makoto? And it's above her. Uh, while the hair doesn't really follow the light source, the clothing does. So the elbow is facing away from the light source, so it has uh, more shading there. Uh, and then the gloved hand under her is also hidden, so there's more shading there as well. Um, and then just above that where the glove starts, uh, that has a lot of shading because the folds bunch up in places there. Um, and that's because folds usually bunch up where clothes kind of shift, either into like a different part of clothing or a different cl article of clothing entirely. And you can see that with a bunch of different kinds of clothing, including pants, shirts, jackets, suits, clothes like that. As for the colors I use for shading, in this case, since the suit is largely grayscale, I'm just going in with a darker gray. But I did add a bit of blue so that the color is more on the cooler side. When shading, it sometimes helps to think about the kind of personality the character has. For example, although some characters have cooler colors in their designs, they still have warmer shading in their official art to show their warm personalities, while it's the opposite for others. For Mikoto, she's kind of super logical and kind of an outcast, kind of cold to certain characters, so I use the blue to kind of show that. And this kind of calls back to how I think colors are chosen for characters, and can again help the whole body feel more cohesive. So next, I'm going to start adding the highlights right on top of the shading, like literally right on top. This is characteristic of Kamatsuzaki's style, and the way to know where the highlights go is to just study his art. Referencing is helpful, but really studying the source material can help you get a better sense of what exactly is he doing, and how exactly is he making those forms. Um, but sometimes the highlighting does get a little confusing, so I do go back in with the shading color, and I go, uh, I make some extra strokes to try to make the folds more clear. 
One thing I do want to touch on that I think warrants some more attention is uh, Mikoto's breasts. So I made her breasts a lot more circular than her original sketch uh, in an attempt to make them look more stylistic, but it's not necessarily perspectively correct. I think the chests in Danganronpa art are pretty inconsistent, but it's almost always stylistic rather than realistic. Here I'm emphasizing Mikoto's chest to show her as a femme fatale kind of character, and you can especially tell that it's emphasized because of how low the cut of her suit is, uh, or where the collar is. If you look at the reference picture, there actually isn't much shading on her breasts, so what's happening is I'm putting folds there that don't necessarily exist using the highlights, and that's something that's not really realistic, because the suit is pretty form-fitting. Like I said, the way female chests are shaded in Kamatsuzaki's art style is pretty inconsistent, Plus, he really started using shading to emphasize female characters' breasts, starting with V3. But it still kind of all depends on the character. Like, Peko and Junko don't have the same level of shading detail, despite them both having sex appeal. Meanwhile, Kaede and Tenko have many folds there, but with Himiko and Kurumi, they're not so emphasized. With Mikoto, I'm portraying the fact that she's a femme fatale, so I'm adding more shading and highlights in that area. So next I'm working on Mikoto's pockets slash bags that are strapped onto her, which are shaded like metallic objects. So this is kind of unique to Komatsuzaki's style, but whenever he has something that's matte or metal, it's usually shaded or highlighted to have almost a second outline. And that's something you can see clearly with Chihiro's computers, you can see it with Chiaki's consoles. It's not entirely realistic, I mean like, usually metal doesn't shine in that way, but I do think it's a charming way of portraying it. So I do tend to use that a lot on like some of the belts, the pockets. You can see even the collar is kind of shaded that way as well. This is the part where I start realizing, wait, she should be wearing latex. Because this is a femme fatale character, she should be wearing something that's more form-fitting like the reference. This goes back to what I said earlier, that I would change how I shaded halfway through the piece. The strokes and techniques I talked about earlier are characteristic of most of Kamatsuzaki's art, so you can still use what I said to help with drawing clothes in his style, but I ended up covering a bunch of it and changing it to more of a latex texture to better fit Mikoto's assassin vibe. I used some more references to help me understand how latex lighting works, because it's a style of shading that's new to me when I made this, and so I pulled up a really shiny latex suit reference that's very form-fitting, and it's a little bit different from what I ended up drawing, but Basically, I started with a flat gray color, and then I went in with an airbrush with white, and I accentuated the center with a darker color while using more white for the sides using my normal brush, so I could try to get that intended effect with the highlights. Um, but when I'm using, when I'm learning a new material like this, it does sometimes come down to trial and error, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. It's kind of how I approach learning Kamatsuzaki's style, in a way. Now for hands. Hands are difficult not because of how they're shaded, but because of their structure. I used to struggle with hands a lot, but really knowing the basic structure of how a hand looks in some basic angles and forms can really help. So for that, it just comes down to looking at a reference and practicing. There's not much else to it. There are a bunch of good YouTube videos and tutorials that can help with that as well. So for the hand holding the gun in this piece, I used references from the left to see how the perspective would affect how that hand would look. And then for the hand on the ground, I kind of went freestyle just relying on what I knew from my own knowledge and my own experience drawing these characters. Uh, so yeah, in terms of shading the hands, there are actually a few things I'd like to highlight. One is that there's extreme shading below the fingers, so where the fingers crease, that's where the shading is the most extreme, and sometimes it'll be a line at the crease, and sometimes it'll just be implied. Another thing is at the tip of the fingers, there's usually a warmer, uh, more pink, more red color at the tip, uh, and that same warmer color is also usually used on the knuckles. Uh, three is that the highlights of the hand usually emphasize the bone structure, so they'll be drawn along the kind of the upper side of the palm where the bones would be. And then the final thing is that there are no fingernails on Danganronpa style hands. And I think this is similar to a lot of anime art. I think a lot of anime does this, uh, but it's just something to think about. So here's the finished product. It's definitely not perfect, but I think I still got pretty close to the Kamatsuzaki art style. After I did all this drawing that you just saw, I actually went back in and edited some, but I didn't record the footage unfortunately, so I'm sorry about that. 
I also added a hair clip that was reminiscent of the Future Foundation, as well as a logo on her thigh. Uh, you can check out why I put those there in the Phoenix Foundation's DRRB file in the description below. Finally, there's a few things that I want to add that happen after a piece is finished. One is that it might be helpful to make the whole drawing more cohesive if you adjust the color curves to make the whole piece more cool or more warm. So as I said before, thinking about what kind of character you are trying to portray can help with what sort of vibe or atmosphere the artwork gives off. So for Mikoto, I kind of kept in mind that the outfit would be cooler because of her personality, so I didn't really need to use the curves. But sometimes when a piece's shading seems inconsistent to me, I'll go in and change the curves. And finally, the texture overlays that I have been using for DRRB are actually different from the ones that official Danganronpa artwork uses. I have the texture that I use linked in the description, but I'm not sure if the official one is available to use. But basically, an overlay at 50% is what I use for the DRRB texture, and that goes on right at the end. So yeah, that's the end of my process video. My process is definitely not the same as Kamatsuzaki, and it's not even that good of an imitation, as much as it is just my own style, so what I've said should probably be taken with a grain of salt. I'm not the best artist, and I still have a long way to go, but I hope I've been able to help at least a bit with drawing in this style. I try to be as thorough as possible with this video, because I haven't seen many tutorials talking about drawing in the splash art style specifically, so some of the things I talked about are kinda all over the place, and sometimes when I'm explaining like technical things, it can get pretty confusing. So please let me know if you have any questions either in the comments or on my Twitter. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for watching this video, and I hope you guys are successful in your own Danganronpa related stuff.